morning, everyone. And welcome to this morning's um, public forum at the Sing Health uh, Duke NUS Lung Center uh, on Cough Myths Busted. My name is uh, Darren. I'm your host and moderator for this morning. And we have a very packed schedule this morning. And uh, thank you all for dialing in on Zoom. Cough is a very common symptom that uh, we encounter in our lives at uh, any point in time. And um, we have many questions of what can be the causes and what are the possible uh, treatments which are available. And uh, we have uh, four amazing speakers this morning lined up to uh, discuss this uh, common symptom. And uh, I would like to introduce them uh, as the session progresses. Some housekeeping rules. Um, for the question and answer, please uh, type it into the Q&A box. This meeting is being uh, partially recorded and uh, the Facebook stream will end after the uh, session three. And uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker for this morning. The first speaker is Dr. Chiu Suye. He is uh, currently a consultant at the Department of uh, Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine in the Singapore General Hospital. His main clinical and research interests are in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pulmonary rehab, and intensive care medicine. And uh, Dr. Chiu runs a multidisciplinary uh, clinic, um, which uh, looks after our patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And today he'll be talking to us about uh, acute cough and the limitations of uh, antibiotic use in this particular setting. Uh, Dr. Chiu. Thank you very much, Prof. It is my pleasure today to share with you uh, my perspectives about the use of antibiotics for acute cough. So let me share my slides. Please let me know if you can't see my slides or hear me clearly. So a very warm welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Chiu Suyuan from Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Today I'll be talking about limitations of antibiotics for acute cough. The question is coming. Okay, so what is cough? Is cough abnormal or normal? Actually, cough is an important human reflex that helps protect our windpipe or airways and lungs. Occasional coughing is normal. For example, if you have some dust, mucus, or infant infection, right? Coughing helps to clear your throat and airways of these uh, poisonous chemicals and toxins. What should you do if you have cough? I'm sure everyone knows that right now we are in the middle of the Omicron wave, right? If you have symptoms of fever, cough, runny nose, sore throat, loss of taste or smell, these are the symptoms of COVID-19 infection. Please perform a COVID-19 self-test or see a GP from a public health preparedness clinic, All right? These are our public health preparedness clinics in Singapore, okay? Now, when should you see a doctor if your cough doesn't get better? Okay, these are some of the warning signs, All right? Number one, you spit up blood when you cough. Number two, you have chest pain or trouble breathing. Number three, you have unexplained weight loss, or if your cough lasts more than eight weeks. If you are a chronic lung patient, some of you out there might have asthma, or you might have this thing called COPD, called smoking lung disease, all right? or you have frequent or chronic cough, please see your healthcare provider if your pattern of cough changes. All right? These chronic lung conditions are often associated with prolonged cough. And if, these, if the pattern of cough changes, all right, it's important to seek care from your doctor. Okay, and when you see a doctor, these are some of the symptoms which a doctor will have to hear from you. How long was your cough? What are your associated symptoms? Fever, sore throat, amount and color of phlegm. All right, I put a picture on the left to show you the different kind of colors that phlegm can be. This can range from clear white color, red color, which is a sign of blood, all right, yellow or green. It is very important to inform your doctor if you have any red flag symptoms, all right, like for example, coughing of blood, you have severe chest pain or unexplained weight loss. And importantly, if you have a history of smoking cigarettes currently or in the past, 
or if you have any chronic lung diseases like asthma. Okay, now on to the topic. Does anyone know what's the difference between a virus and a bacteria? Okay, I'll put a picture here on the right to show you what is a bacteria and what is a virus. All right, a bacteria is a much bigger living organism compared to a virus. All right, a bacteria can actually divide and reproduce by itself. All right, whereas a virus needs a human host or a living host to reproduce. Some of you might know from your uh, microbiology or science days that certain bacteria that in fact on respiratory tract will include things like streptococcus, mycoplasma, or pertussis. All right. The most common virus that we have now in the community that's causing uh, acute cough is COVID-19. But other kinds of viruses which cause cough include influenza or the seasonal flu. All right. And that's pretty common. And some of you might actually uh, receive yearly influenza vaccines uh, to protect yourself against this virus. Okay, so viruses and bacteria are very different. They are very different living organisms and hence the treatment is very different, right? Now, what do antibiotics do? All right, antibiotics affect bacterial cells and they disrupt many parts of their function like their cell wall, their DNA reproduction, protein synthesis, all right? Antibiotics do not uh, affect viruses. All right. Some examples of antibiotics are shown. All right. You might see this from your GP clinic or hospital doctor. For example, augmentin, neofloxacin, or amoxicillin capsules. All right. Now, should you ask for antibiotics when you have cough? All right. Now, it is important to first understand what is the cause of your cough. Is it a virus infection All right. caused by the flu, sore throat, or common cold? Or is it a bacterial infection? such as your streptococcal throat, your tuberculosis, whooping cough or pertussis, all right? Um, in fact, it's been estimated that up to 70 to 80% of acute um, respiratory tract infections are actually due to viral infections. So if you were to have the typical symptoms of a viral infection, which will include sore throat, fever, myalgia or muscle ache, all right, lethargy, all right, antibiotics will not help you actually. However, if your doctor has determined that you have a bacterial infection, all right, then antibiotics will be useful. Okay, now what are the expected durations of cough when you have any of these infections? So typically, the common cold or flu, which we also call medically as the acute respiratory tract infection, usually lasts about three to seven days. In diagnosis bronchitis, typically this is characterized by wheezing or noisy breathing. The cough can last longer, up to three weeks, but in some patients can become chronic. These are typically people who have a history of smoking or chronic lung disease. All right, I'm sure everyone knows about COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 infection uh, is well known to cause prolonged cough. And on average, it's been reported that it can last up to three weeks, but depending on the severity of the infection, it can last even longer. Typically, patients who are hospitalized for severe COVID infection, who need oxygen, or even go to the intensive care unit may have very prolonged cough. If a person has a bacterial or viral pneumonia, cough can last as long as six weeks. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, pertussis, which is a type of bacteria, can cause cough that lasts for 10 weeks or longer. For those who, uh, who have heard about, about it, pertussis is also known as the 100 day cough or by recur, all right? And this cough can last very long. So in summary, it is important that antibiotics are not required for viral infections, all right? So if you have cold, flu, or even hand foot mouth disease, antibiotics don't work. And most of these symptoms will go away within three to seven days. How should you help yourself then if you have cough from these viral infections? These are some simple tips that you can use. Keep yourself well hydrated by drinking small amounts of water throughout the day. Soothe your throat by drinking a warm drink, such as honey or lemon. Try taking sips of liquid if you feel yourself starting to cough or suck a sugary sweet if you feel yourself coughing. If you have no drinks available near you, try swallowing your saliva repeatedly to help lubricate your throat. And finally, if you have a runny nose, try to blow your nose rather than sniff. This helps to clear the mucus from your nose, All right? Antibiotics, if used inappropriately, can cause many side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal bloatedness or wind, loss of appetite or even rashes, All right? So it's important that we only use antibiotics for bacterial infections, for example, a lung infection like pneumonia, a streptococcal throat, or even a bacterial ear infection. 
if we use antibiotics wrongly, we might actually promote this problem called antibiotic resistance. A simple harmful bacteria can become a superbug if we were to use antibiotics wrongly. And these antibiotics uh, resistant bacteria can actually be much more difficult to treat. All right, patients have to stay longer in hospital. They are more likely to require uh, severe uh, life support in the ICU, for example, and costs of treatment will go up. All right. If you are given antibiotics by your doctor, make sure you take your antibiotics exactly as per your doctor's advice. All right. Uh, adopt a healthy lifestyle and practice good hygiene. All right. And do not save antibiotics for the next time you get sick. Discard all leftover antibiotics. All right. So these are some take home messages from my talk. All right. It's important to recognize that cough is a natural defense response to expel harmful substances from your body, your lungs and throat. And these are detected by cough receptors. All right. The majority of cough for common colds are actually caused by viruses which are not killed by antibiotics. And therefore, these infections should be treated with simple things such as drinking cold water or warm water to soothe the throat. All right. Taking some cough suppressants sometimes if the cough is very bad. All right, rather than asking for antibiotics. And it's finally important to know that antibiotics do not hasten recovery from viral infection, and if used inappropriately, may cause side effects and promote development of antibiotic resistance. Thank you very much. This is my last slide, and we'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for uh, the wonderful talk on uh, how to what not to do for uh, an acute cough, as well as what to do for it. Um, I'd like to move on and uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, who will be talking about um, other potential causes of cough, other than infections, which uh, Dr. Chu had talked about. Um, Dr. Michelle Cole is an associate consultant in the Department of Pretty and Critical Care Medicine in Singapore General Hospital. She has a clinical interest in the management of refractory chronic cough and pulmonary hypertension. And she's leading the disciplinary refractory cough clinic in SGH. And she's going to talk to us now about cough being more than a lung problem and what are the possible causes. Uh, Michelle, perhaps over to you. Thank you, Prof, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to share uh, my slides on what uh, is potentially causing your cough and how I may potentially help you um, solve it. Um, is my slides available for screening? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, so I'm excited giving today's talk on cough and what may be causing a chronic cough and what you can do about it. So before we begin, um, how common is chronic cough exactly? A study done showed that actually 2 to 7% of Asian has chronic cough. And within Singapore itself, a survey in 2010 had reported that out of all the patients whom sought a doctor's consult in the polyclinics or GP, 25% of them were actually for complaints of cough. Chronic cough is actually defined as a cough lasting more than eight weeks in adults. And some problems that patients can encounter when they have chronic cough include that of stress urinary incontinence, where they may potentially accidentally pass urine on coughing, reduce quality of life due to sleep disturbances, and some patients also can get anxious and depressed because of social isolation, especially so in current COVID pandemic. Some do experience fainting on coughing and in severe cases, rib fractures can also happen after severe bouts of coughing. Patients can also get hernias or prolapse of the uterus and vagina because of prolonged increased abdominal pressure in chronic cough. So in view of these potential complications, one should not take the issue of chronic cough lightly. Now I'll go further into the details of what may potentially be causing your chronic cough. So chronic cough may not always be due to a lung problem. Studies have shown that some of the top causes of chronic cough may be due to GERD, upper airway cough syndrome, side effects of some common medications you may be taking, and asthma. Of course, if patients have red flag symptoms such as unexplained weight loss, breathlessness, fever, coughing of blood, there are important diagnoses that we must exclude such as infection, cancer, or other lung diseases. Once all the common and important diagnoses have been, have been excluded, a portion of patients with chronic cough may have refractory chronic cough, which is also known as cough hypersensitivity syndrome. 
The purposes of today's talk, I will elaborate more on GERD, UACS, drugs, asthma, and recourse. So GERD is actually known to be amongst the top chronic cause in adults. So what exactly is GERD? It is actually a long-term condition where there is backflow of acid from the stomach into the food pipe. And this is usually because the sphincter or the rubber band-like muscle at the bottom of the food pipe is not tight, allowing for the stomach contents and acid to go up into the food pipe. So how does backflow of acid into our food pipe actually cause our cough? This is so because our food pipe and our windpipe or trachea are actually situated next to each other. And as acid from the stomach backflows into the food pipe, this can spill over and cause irritation of the throat and cause you to cough. So symptoms that patients with GERD may experience include that of heartburn, which is a burning-like sensation in the mid to lower chest, regurgitation of stomach contents or vomiting, bad breath, persistent dry cough, sore throat, chest pain, and difficulty breathing. Some of these symptoms you may find tend to be worse after heavy meal or upon lying down and may be better in the upright position. So some suggestions on how to manage your gut would firstly be to adjust your lifestyle habits. This would comprise of maintaining an upright posture during and about an hour after meals, break up your large meals into more frequent smaller meals, maintaining an active lifestyle with regular exercise as tolerated, elevate the head of your bed with pillows to prevent backflow of stomach contents when sleeping and to avoid eating two hours before bedtime. Avoid triggers that can worsen reflux, such as smoking and too much alcohol, citrus foods and drinks, including caffeine, and to wear loose fitting thing around the stomach area to prevent added pressure on the stomach. If lifestyle changes are not sufficient, there can be anti-reflux medications such as omeprazole, Gaviscon to control the acid reflux and if all else fails, we would advise you to seek a gastroenterologist consult. So the next common cause of chronic cough is that of upper airway cough syndrome or UACS for short. So UACS is a condition where the nose or sinus produces extra mucus and as the nasal airways in the throat are all connected, this mucus can drip down the back of your throat and trigger off the cough reflex. This condition is often associated with rhinitis and chronic rhinosinusitis, which we know as nose allergies or sensitive nose. Patients often experience symptoms of a tickling cough that tends to be worse in the mornings and at night, the sensation of a lump or mucus stuck in the throat, the need to frequently clear their throat and experience post-nasal drip. So how can we manage UACS? The first step would be to avoid potential triggers that you find can irritate your nose. Common allergies would be that of house dust mites, pet dander, smoke or environmental haze, perfumes, and even vapors from some cleaning products. Antihistamines such as Telfast D, nasal decongestants such as pseudoephedrine found in Clarinase, and nasal steroids such as Avamis or Nasonex can help. Red flags that one should look out for include that of coughing up of blood, wheezing, breathing difficulties, giddiness, or fainting spells. Should any of these happen to you, we would advise you to seek medical attention immediately. So moving on to some of the common medications that may potentially be causing your cough. The first would be the drug class of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors called ACE inhibitors for short. This is a medication often used to control blood pressure and literature has shown that approximately 1.5 to 11% of patients on this medication may develop dry cough. Some of the commonly used ACE inhibitors that you may be on are enalapril, lisinopril, and perindopril. Next, citagliptin, which is a medication used in diabetes, has also been found to be a cause for chronic cough by aggravating nasal and cough symptoms in someone that is already known to have a sensitive nose. Lastly, a common group of medications known as the calcium channel blockers, which is used in blood pressure control, aggravates underlying reflux symptoms in a patient. Commonly used calcium channel blockers include that of amlodipine and mifedipine. So if you were to find that you have chronic cough that is troubling you and happen to be one on one of these chronic medications, you would advise prescribing doctor's opinion first before changing or stopping your medications on your own. So some patients with chronic cough may actually have underlying undiagnosed asthma. So asthma is actually a very common condition affecting 20% of children in Singapore, 5% of the adult population. The estimated annual economic burden for asthma is high and amounted up to $2.09 billion SING in 2021. 
So asthma is a condition where the airways in the lungs are reactive and inflamed, and this can cause resultant narrowing of the airways, making airflow in and out of the lungs more difficult. Rather than experiencing breathlessness and wheezing like in a typical asthma attack, some patients may only present with dry cough as the main symptom in what we call cough variant asthma. So typical symptoms of an asthma attack include that of shortness of breath, dry cough, cough that tends to be worse at night or in the early mornings, wheezing during an attack, and chest tightness. So asthma is actually diagnosed via the symptoms that a patient experiences, as mentioned earlier, and on their physical examination of the lungs. In addition, a special blowing test called the lung function test can also be used to diagnose asthma to look for presence of reversible obstruction in the airways. So we would advise you to see your doctor for the following. First, if you think you have asthma because of frequent coughing or wheezing that lasts more than a few days, or any other signs or symptoms of asthma, such as shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, reduced stamina when you exercise. Two, for continued management of your asthma after a diagnosis has been made. Good long-term control of asthma is known to help prevent long-term lung damage and other complications. Three, if your asthma symptoms get worse, for example, you find yourself having more frequent asthma attacks or needing to use your rescue inhalers more often. And lastly, for emergency treatment, if you experience rapid worsening of breathlessness or wheezing that does not improve despite use of rescue inhalers, or you find yourself much more breathless than usual even when at rest or doing minimal activities. In such a situation, these are considered as symptoms of an acute asthma attack, and we would advise you to go to your nearest GP or polyclinic doctor, and in severe cases, to call an ambulance and go to the ED directly. So good management of asthma involves taking your prescribed inhalers regularly as advised by the doctor, and these are some of the common inhalers used in asthma treatment. We would advise getting yourself vaccinated, and you may wish to speak to your family doctor for your relevant vaccination schedule. Asthma patients should identify their common triggers of an asthma attack and learn to avoid them by changing some lifestyle habits. And recognition of the beginnings of an asthma attack is also crucial so that you can take early actions to prevent your symptoms from escalating. And lastly, when you see your doctor, you should ask for an asthma action plan, which will guide you in recognition of symptoms, the dose and frequency of your inhalers, and medications that you need to take and when to seek urgent help. We strongly recommend all of you to follow your asthma action plan closely to prevent life-threatening asthma attacks or poorly controlled asthma that can have long-term damage to the lungs. So lastly, I will move on to the final topic on refractory chronic cough. So the Mayo Clinic in the US described the entity called cough hypersensitivity syndrome, where initially a patient may have an underlying reason for his acute cough, such as, for example, a viral infection or an allergen exposure. Over time, as the cough progresses, the cough center in the brain becomes more sensitive and the urge to cough increases even when there is no trigger factor. So as time goes by, the urge to cough continues to increase and this reinforces the cough signals in the brain and becomes a vicious cycle. As such, there is a need to break this cycle by modifying the perception of cough in a patient. And this diagnosis, however, can only be made once all other causes of cough has been ruled out. So in summary, as mentioned, the diagnosis of refractory chronic cough can only be made in a person who has prolonged cough of more than eight weeks without presence of a typical trigger for cough and remains a diagnosis of exclusion. The SGH Lung Center and Department of Otolaryngology will be setting up a refractory chronic cough clinic this year. And this clinic is intended for patients who have persistent chronic cough after exclusion of other causes. It will involve specialists from ENT, myself from respiratory medicine, as well as speech therapists. What we do in this special clinic is we would do a simple bedside stroboscopy examination to inspect the vocal cords, look for any vocal cord abnormalities such as inappropriate closure and movements of the vocal cords and also other abnormalities or growths such as polyps or nodules. We will also be conducting a phlegm test to identify presence of inflammatory patterns in the lungs of patients with refractory chronic cough. So in this clinic, we can actually prescribe medications to dampen the cough reflex in these patients who are known to have a heightened hypersensitive cough reflex, such as with the use of morphine or gabapentin, which are known to be able to modify the cough reflex, reduce the urge to cough, and also provide symptom relief from cough. Other interventions that can be performed would be Botox injections to the nerve involved in the cough reflex to reduce cough, or injection into the vocal cords to allow complete closure when needed. Our speech therapists 
can also guide patients in cough control therapy uh, to modify the psychological behavior driving their urge to cough. Internationally, there are also ongoing studies looking at medications that specifically target signals in the cough reflex to reduce a person's urge to cough, which we hope to eventually implement in the future. So finally, on to my last slide, the three key messages that I would like everyone to take home today would be that if you're experiencing chronic cough, you are likely not alone as it happens more often than you think, and it can be disturbing for many people. Chronic cough is not always a lung problem. As we have gone through, there are several other non-lung causes that may be contributing to your cough, such as reflux, upper airway cough syndrome, and perhaps some of the common medications that you may be taking. Lastly, beware of the red flag symptoms such as accompanying breathlessness, blood in phlegm, unexplained weight loss, fever, giddiness or fainting spells. Should any of these occur or should you be concerned, please consult your doctor. So thank you everyone for listening. I've now come to the end of my presentation and I wish everyone a great weekend ahead. I'll be happy to take questions at the end of this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Ko, for this uh, um, very extensive talk on chronic and cough and its potential causes. Um, and it's good to see that um, we're going to be having a combined clinic, multidisciplinary clinic to uh, tackle these uh, cases of uh, chronic cough. Um, I'd like to remind our audience, uh, please uh, un enter your questions into the Q&A box uh, and so that we can answer them at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ken Lee, Associate Professor, Assistant Professor Ken Lee. He's a respiratory and critical care consultant at the Singapore General Hospital. He leads the bronchiectasis service in the department and the smoking cessation program. Um, he's in, actively involved in teaching and research on airway diseases. And he's going to talk to us about why cough mixtures are not always the solution to um, cough. Uh, Ken, over to you. Thanks, Prof. Um, a very good morning to our participants. Uh, I can see that uh, we have a huge audience uh, this morning. So um, coughing is a very common problem that a lot of us face. So, and a lot of times uh, for most of us, when we cough, uh, the first thing we turn to is a uh, cough mixture. Uh, but today I'm going to present to you why cough mixtures are not always the solution uh, to your cough problems. Okay. Okay, um, can everyone see this slide? Yes, yes we can. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, these will be the areas I'm covering for uh, today's presentation. I will first touch a little bit on the background of cough. Uh, then I'll move on to talk about cough mixture itself. And finally, I'll touch a bit on uh, uh, patients with chronic lung diseases who present with cough. So um, how much coughing is normal? I think all of us cough every now and then. Uh, some notice the cough a bit more than others. And um, so research has actually been performed looking at the number of coughs that a healthy individual uh, coughs a day. And uh, on average, a person may cough 18 coughs uh, over 24 hours. Uh, females tend to cough more than males. And uh, it's found that um, uh, these coughs tend to happen during the daytime. And uh, if we look at the uh, frequency of, um, of uh, I mean, uh, the, the people who experience cough uh, and who have attended specialist cough clinics around the world, uh, this is a, a survey which included um, uh, 10,000 participants um, uh, who attend um, cough centers in the UK, the US, and parts of Asia. And you can see uh, some interesting findings from, from this uh, chart here. First of all, uh, you can see that most of the uh, patients with chronic cough actually presents, um, you know, from the middle to, to the uh, higher age groups. And secondly, you can also see that uh, starting from uh, 30 years and above, uh, most of the patients who have chronic cough are actually females. So there's a significantly higher proportion of uh, females compared to males who actually experience uh, chronic cough. So why do healthy people cough? Okay, um, 
remember the haze a few a few years ago? We get it every uh, every now and then. Um, during hazy conditions, you'll find that uh, uh, those people, especially with uh, underlying lung conditions, they tend to cough more. And even for healthy individuals um, without any conditions, uh, you may feel uncomfortable and you may cough every now and then uh, during this hazy period. And if uh, you happen to be standing near a burning building, you shouldn't be surprised if you find yourself coughing a little bit more as well. So why did I uh, bring out these examples? These, these examples are obvious triggers that could um, uh, make someone cough. And it also uh, highlights uh, a point that was already previously mentioned uh, by Dr. Xu in the first uh, presentation, that cough itself has an important function. Um, it actually protects our airways from harmful agents that's inhaled or produced within the airways and the lungs. And the uh, cough also prevents a severe chest infection. So if you look at the uh, diagram uh, on the left, uh, you can see that we have a, a food pipe known as the esophagus, as well as a, the windpipe, which is the trachea. So the windpipe is you know, where air is supposed to go in and out, and the esophagus is where your food goes in. So uh, when we say aspiration, uh, what we mean is aspiration is the process whereby you know, uh, a person inhales a foreign body. So for instance, um, when someone swallows food, instead of going to the food pipe, the esophagus, it accidentally enters the trachea. Okay, and that could potentially cause severe problems like uh, you know, pneumonia. So that's what we mean by aspiration. So um, when we talk about the duration of cough, there's a few uh, uh, cut off uh, in terms of the time points that uh, are quite significant that I think might be useful for our, for our audience this morning. Usually, if the cough is less than three weeks, it's considered to be acute cough. If it lasts beyond eight weeks, we term it as a chronic cough, and anywhere in between is a subacute cough. So if someone, say, experiences a normal cold uh, flu, most, in most instances, it gets better after one to two weeks. If uh, the cough persists after three weeks, then uh, in most instances, you, might want, you may want to consult a doctor to see whether uh, further evaluation is needed for your cough. So um, I think by the time uh, the patients see us in the clinic, um, there's a few, uh, th these are the experiences that I actually gather from the patients I see, okay? So there, you might be one of the patients who, who find that there's only this one cough mixture, that maybe the black cough mixture that works for me, okay? And then there may be some patients who say that, you know, I've tried multiple cough mixtures and none of them seem to work. And then there's another group of patients who, who are afraid to take cough mixtures. So how... How effective exactly are cough mixtures? Okay, so um, uh, before I answer the question, um, I think it's useful to know that uh, generally we can divide cough mixtures broadly into uh, two different groups. There's the expectorants, uh, which are cough mixtures that actually make the patient cough a little bit more. Okay, uh, and also there's the antitussis. These are the cough mixtures that actually suppress the cough so that the patient uh, coughs less or hopefully uh, get, get rid of the cough co uh, completely. So these different uh, categories of cough mixture actually serve um, different functions. The expectorants usually has a mucolytic component. And what that means is that if a patient has a significant amount of, of phlegm, which is thick and hard to cough up, these cough mixtures actually help to loosen up the phlegm and makes it easier for the, the patients to cough out the phlegm. On the other hand, you have uh, patients who experience dry cough and you know, the, the cough is just making you feel really uncomfortable. In these cases, taking a little bit of the antitussis uh, would help maybe reduce the cough and make, uh, make it less uncomfortable for you. And I'm sure a lot of our participants have, have also tried cough mixtures, which is a mix, uh, which has a mix of ingredients. A lot of the cough mixtures these days actually have um, antihistamines, decongestants, because uh, they actually help to relieve um, the concurrent symptoms of, uh, say, runny nose, uh, other than the cough that the, the patient might be experiencing. So what is the evidence for cough mixture? How effective are the cough mixtures that we have? Okay, unfortunately, the research shows that um, there's no strong evidence to suggest that cough mixtures are more effective or less effective compared to placebo. So what that means is that if, if, uh, if someone has a cough, he might just maybe... Um, get a sweet, suck on the sweet, and the cough may get better. And conversely, 
you might have someone uh, with a cough who tries various cough mixture and nothing seems to work. So unfortunately, we do not have the um, so-called cough elixir that can um, uh, correct the cough for, for every, every person. So uh, there may be some people who ask, you know, is there one cough mixture that's stronger than the rest? Is there something that can, I can take, you know, that can uh, completely remove my cough symptoms? Um, so I'll just show you this, okay? This is a cough mixture, which was actually uh, given in the 1800s. So it was more than hundred years ago. You can see that the cough mixture in the past were very strong, okay? So this, uh, this one that I show you here is called the one night cough syrup. This cough syrup um, guarantees that the, your cough is, is uh, resolved within one night, okay? And it promises that you have a good sleep. If you look at the ingredients in this cough syrup, it includes alcohol, cannabis, chloroform, morphine, okay? And chloroform is something, uh, I think you guys know that's uh, something poisonous, that's, uh, you, you can find it in pesticides, you can find it in the solvents that's used for uh, your clean cleansers and so on. Um, other, other common ingredients in, the, in cough syrup uh, used in the past includes uh, opium, heroin. Thankfully today, um, uh, cough mixtures, cough medications are more tightly regulated for safety reasons. And these are the ingredients that you'll find in, in the cough mixtures nowadays. I'll just uh, talk a little bit more about the first two because dextromethorphan and uh, promethazine codeine are the two uh, common ingredients uh, in cough mixture that's used uh, in the hospitals and the clinics uh, uh, by doctors. So touch a little bit more on codeine. Okay, um, codeine is a common ingredient uh, in a lot of the cough mixture and it's something which I want to highlight because uh, of two reasons. Number one, the side effects it can cause, and number two, the addiction potential. Okay, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but um, codeine can cause addiction because number one, it's in the same class of medications as morphine. Okay, I think a lot of us know that we can get potentially addicted to morphine. Codeine is no different. In fact, codeine is broken down by our body, uh, it's metabolized into morphine. So someone who keeps taking procodeine, any codeine containing a uh, cough mixture could potentially be addicted. So this is just a summary of the potential side effects that someone could experience. Um, it could be something mild, maybe just uh, some nausea, constipation, uh, some rashes, dry mouth, but it could also lead to uh, significant severe side effects. You know, patients could be confused, they could get seizures, in some cases, low blood pressure, and uh, some of these things could potentially be dangerous. Um, if you're addicted to it and you try to stop um, you know, taking codeine, some of the withdrawal symptoms you may experience include sweating, chills, irritability, fatigue, digestive problems, or diarrhea. Um, so usually when, uh, when patients visit doctors multiple times and request for say codeine containing solutions, uh, doctors will take note. Okay, they will see whether you have any signs of dependence on the codeine and sometimes uh, suggest switching you to a different uh, cough syrup instead. So these are the national guidelines from our uh, ministry, okay? Uh, and you can see here that um, uh, codeine containing cough mixtures may be used uh, for symptomatic relief of a uh, cough. But if your cough persists for eight weeks undiagnosed, you should firstly be referred to a respiratory uh, specialist. And also uh, doctors uh, are expected to screen patients for potential dependence or addiction to opioids. In this case, we're talking about uh, codeine containing uh, med um, cough syrup. And if there's any suspicion that there might be some addiction, uh, that uh, these patients might be reported um, to the CNB and Director of uh, Medical Services. So I think it's important to, to remember that the cough syrup only treats our symptoms and it does not treat the cause of the symptoms or speed up recovery. Uh, therefore, when, when you have persistent cough, I think it's uh, not enough to simply take a cough syrup to try to uh, uh, control the symptoms. It is important to find out the cause of your cough and sometimes you may need to do further investigations. So moving on, uh, I will talk a little bit about patients with chronic lung diseases, uh, whether uh, there's any role for cough mixtures in these cases. Okay, so um, these are the common uh, chronic lung diseases that, uh, that we see in the clinic. Patients with asthma, uh, COPD, bronchiectasis and interstitial lung disease. I'll just touch very briefly on each of them. So asthma, Okay, asthma is a inflammatory condition. Okay, usually patients may have asthma from, from young. Essentially, these patients have chronic inflammation in the airways. Okay, uh, there may be tightening of the air muscles. There may be increased mucus production. So 
Patients with asthma may, may uh, present with cough, usually happens at night. Okay, uh, there may be wheezing, there may be chest tightness, breathlessness. Uh, uh, Dr. Shaw has said before, there may be cases of asthma whereby so if you have a persistent cough, I think uh, this is one of the things we want to investigate. You go to the doctor, there's some specific tests we may do for you to see whether you have asthma. And the, why is that important? Because treatment for asthma uh, in, includes uh, steroid inhalers. And nowadays, we also have newer medications called biologics. Uh, cough mixture alone would not uh, uh, control your symptoms. Secondly, uh, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, COPD. So this is uh, also a chronic inflammatory condition. Um, uh, the symptoms might be similar to uh, asthmatics, but the difference is that COPD tends to affect chronic smokers. Okay, those who have smoked uh, cigarettes for, for many years. And uh, this years of smoking actually has uh, effects on both the airways uh, uh, as well as uh, changes in the lungs. So, so uh, patients may present with inflammation, uh, excess mucus secretion in the airways. Uh, there might be changes in the lungs, what we term as emphysema, uh, which can cause some breathing difficulty. So the cough that these patients uh, have could potentially be dry cough, you know, it may be triggered by the smoking itself, or it might be wet cough because of the increased mucus production. Uh, they may also present wheezing, chest tightness, and breathlessness. So in these cases, uh, the way we want to control cough in these patients would be number one, stop smoking, because smoking itself worsens the cough. You know, there's no, uh, there's really no point in uh, taking cough mixture and then continuing the cigarettes. Okay, and number two, uh, we also have inhalers to try to uh, improve some of the symptoms, such as breathlessness for patients with uh, COPD. The third condition, bronchiectasis, uh, a little bit less heard of. Uh, this is a condition that usually uh, affects uh, patients in the older age group, although there might be rare cases, uh, you know, some underlying uh, conditions whereby uh, patients in a younger age group may also experience bronchiectasis. For this condition, uh, patients typically have cough with lots of mucus, so they have phlegm every day, okay? Uh, in more severe conditions, they may even cough blood. Uh, other symptoms uh, patients may, may experience include breathlessness, fatigue, they may have frequent chest infections, and some of them may even experience weight loss because some of these chest infections uh, lead to weight loss. So in these conditions, uh, instead of suppressing the cough, it is even more important to make sure that these patients clear the secretions and coughing actually helps to do that. So how we manage this condition is we get the patient to learn some chest physiotherapy techniques so that he's able to perform, uh, he's able to clear his airways on his own at home. Okay, that way we can prevent uh, chest infections from happening we can reduce the inflammation in the lungs. And uh, sometimes if the patient has infections or if we want to give some uh, anti-inflammatory agents to try to control the symptoms, patients may be given antibiotics um, for long, long periods of time. And the last condition I'll be talking about is interstitial lung disease. Okay, this is also fairly rare. Uh, essentially, this is a condition whereby there's a change in the texture of the lungs. Okay, so uh, the lungs turn fibrotic. Okay, fibrosis in lungs, uh, there's some hardening in areas of lungs. And essentially, these affected areas of the lungs, which turn fibrotic, um, uh, could, could uh, lead to problems like uh, causing the patients to cough a bit more. Typically, patients present with dry cough. In fact, uh, about 70 to 80% of patients with interstitial lung disease have dry cough. Other con common symptoms they may have include breathlessness again, fatigue. And because this interstitial lung disease is also associated with some other uh, autoimmune in, uh, conditions, uh, if, you, if you see a doctor, uh, he, uh, the doctor may ask you for additional symptoms like rashes, joint pains, muscle pain, and so on. So um, it is important to, uh, uh, see, uh, to be seen by specialists for this condition because there are specific medications uh, to treat uh, the fibrotic areas of the lungs, and this can only be prescribed by a, a lung specialist. Okay, so um, this is my last slide. To summarize what we have covered today, uh, again, I wish to highlight that, number one, cough has a protective role. Uh, unfortunately, there's no strong evidence on the effectiveness of cough mixtures. Uh, generally, we can give cough suppressants for the uh, treatment of acute cough. If you have flu, you have a bit of cough, we can give you some cough mixtures to, to treat the symptoms. But if you have a uh, cough that's due to chronic lung diseases like asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, uh, cough suppressants are generally not recommended. And uh, you should really visit the doctor for an assessment if you uh, have persistent cough. 
Okay, so I think that is my last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for the very informative talk on uh, the possible causes of uh, chronic cough and how do we use uh, cough suppressants or cough mixtures in the right way. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, but before that, I would like to remind the audience, uh, please uh, put your questions into the question and answer box. Um, and uh, Facebook Live will stop streaming um, from here onwards. Um, smokers and non-smokers can, can, can get lung cancer. What do you need to know? Dr. Jillian Lai is a consultant medical oncologist at the National Cancer Center Singapore, and she subspecializes in thoracic, head and neck, and genital urinary cancers. She uh, has a very strong interest in thoracic oncology and is involved in uh, multiple research programs into the uh, non-smoking uh, Asian phenotype in lung cancer and is an active member and leads the Lung Cancer Consortium Singapore. Um, so, Julian, over to you to talk to us about smokers and all for that. Thank you, Julian, for the last talk on uh, lung cancer. I'd like to invite all the panelists to uh, switch on the cameras and join us in this uh, question and answer forum. Um, I'd like to invite the audience again to uh, please put your questions into the Q&A box. And we will try to answer them as best as we can, uh, given the time that we have, uh, which is half an hour. Uh, and we have almost uh, close to 100 questions right now. Some of them will be answered uh, live, and some of them you will see the answers in the Q&A uh, box. So let's just get started. Um, perhaps like to uh, ask uh, uh, Ken first to uh, answer a couple of questions on uh, bronchiectasis, as well as I think there were one or two questions on cough mixtures, Pipakao versus Western uh, cough mixtures. And the third question, I think, is whether cough mixtures are addictive. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, the, the list of questions is quite long, so we'll touch a little bit on the bronchiectasis. Uh, I think the question on bronchiectasis is uh, what causes bronchiectasis, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, can so um, uh, for bronchiectasis, essentially, uh, we did mention, uh, you know, that patients tend to have a lot of productive cough, and that's because uh, the the airways in these patients are uh, dilated; they're bigger than normal. And uh, actually, based on research, uh, more than fifty percent of the time, uh, ma majority of cases of bronchiectasis do not have a known reason. Okay, among those uh, patients whereby we are able to find the reason for the bronchiectasis. It is, uh, in most instances, due to a previous severe infection. It could be a severe pneumonia they had when they're younger. It could be uh, due to, like, say, tuberculosis, for instance, because the infection that, they re uh, that the patients had during the, uh, during the period of infection, it causes inflammation of the airways, causes some structural damage to the airways, and as a result, it causes distortion. And because of that, uh, mucus accumulates, and the airways do not have the same ability to clear phlegm the way a normal person does. Okay, so that's how it is. I mean, there are some rarer causes of bronchiectasis. Uh, there's associations with certain autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, for instance. And that's why when you see the doctor, uh, they will usually order some investigations uh, to see whether you have some of these other conditions or even screen your immune, uh, some of the immunoglobulin levels, your antibodies, to see whether you're more prone to infection. Okay, so that, that kind of uh, hopefully answers the question of bronchiectasis. Uh, the second question was a question comparing PIPA to, uh, to Western medicine. Okay, so that uh, tricky question, okay, because uh, I think you will find that different um, patients have different experiences. And I will tell you that I, when I take PIPA, I feel better as well. Okay, so um, it is true. Okay, I, I believe that uh, uh, PIPA is useful for cough symptoms. Um, I don't know all the ingredients in PIPA but we know that a lot of these PIPA they may have a honey base. They may have some menthol component, which are known to have a... Um, uh, known to, to improve cough symptoms. So even if it's not pee bark, even if you take a hot honey drink, for instance, uh, you, you might feel better, your cough might, might improve. As I mentioned earlier in the studies, you know, people have done uh, studies comparing cough mixtures, your Western medicine, so-called, and compared it to placebo, meaning if you were to take a sweet, you take a drink, uh, something that soothes the throat, and really there's no uh, suggestion that uh, cough mixture is more effective. So I think your pee bark, if it works for you, is great. I think you can, you can take that, no problem. Okay, um, 
And the uh, third question, sorry, I, I forgot what's the third question. Whether uh, cowfishes are addictive. I think there was one question on that. Oh, yes, correct. So, so uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, uh, the, the key ingredient we are worried about in cough mixtures are those that contain codeine because codeine itself uh, is an opioid. It's in the same class of medicine as morphine. So the same way you can get addicted to morphine, you can get addicted to codeine. So yes, certain cough syrups uh, may be addictive. So if, if, um, if your doctor assesses you to have some dependence on certain kind of cough mixture, he might switch you to a different one uh, to make it, uh, you know, to, to reduce the risk of you being addicted to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, if you can go back to the next previous question uh, before this. Samuel? Sorry, Abra, which question do you want to go, sir? Yeah. Uh, the one on mitigating chronic cough. I think there was a couple of questions as well on um, um, chronic cough and how it's related to uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, gut symptoms. Um, perhaps you can ask uh, uh, Su Yuan to answer that question, or oh, Michelle? Um, hi, Prof. I'll be happy to take this question. Um, so I think the question was about how GERD can actually cause cough. Um, so as explained previously, what GERD essentially is, is that um, it is a, a reflux of stomach contents up into our food pipe. Usually uh, in, our, in all human beings, in our food pipe at the bottom, there's actually a sphincter or a rubber band-like muscle, which actually keeps the bottom of the food pipe tightened. Um, as we age or in certain conditions, as this rubber band-like mus muscle actually loosens, the stomach contents can actually go back up the food pipe. Um, what happens in GERD that causes this cough is that our food pipe and our windpipe, which is our trachea, are actually situated next to each other. And sometimes when there's actually reflux of the stomach contents, um, uh, which usually contains quite acidic uh, kind of contents, it can actually irritate the neighboring windpipe and actually cause vocal cord irritation and throat irritation and can cause a persistent cough. Thank you. Um, there are also a couple of questions on uh, you know, patients who have had uh, cough for a long time um, with no apparent cause, and uh, that's uh, a question perhaps that would you be you know, yeah. good to answer as well. Yeah. Okay, so I saw that there was a question based on um, uh, someone who has had cough, unexplained cough for many years, and it seems to occasionally respond to some antibiotics and also respond to prednisolone. Um, I think that was the question on the previous slide. So in such a situation, some of the potential causes could be that of cough variant asthma, seeing as how the cough seemed to have improved with the treatment of steroids, but other possibilities could also be that of upper airway cough syndrome, whereby it is due to uh, post-nasal drip, meaning mucus dripping from the nasal airways into the throat due to a sensitive nose, and other things, as I mentioned previously, could be that of a, a cough hypersensitivity syndrome, which is a refractory chronic cough. Um, so we would advise you to, if you are very bothered by the symptoms, we would advise you to seek your doctor's uh, consult and opinion for referral to the relevant lung specialist so that you can get further evaluation and management. Thank you very much. Um, I think the next question is on uh, cough in an elderly population. As we know, Singapore has an aging population and uh, there are causes, uh, potential causes of cough in this elderly population. Uh, it says, my elderly mom has been coughing as and when for years. She's seen multiple doctors. Uh, and doctor says that her cough is due to her lungs are weak. Is there anything that she can do to improve that? Maybe Sir Yuan can ask you to answer that, Dr. Chiu. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, this is a very common uh, question that we see in patients in our clinic. Um, I think it's what Ken mentioned. Coughing is a natural reflex to protect the lung against uh, inhalation of food particles or even saliva. Uh, what we do see that's uh, more common in the elderly is swallowing difficulties. Older adults can have stroke or they may have neural problems like Parkinson's disease and these conditions affect the ability of the adult to swallow. So when swallowing function is affected, uh, elderly uh, adults can actually be noticed to be coughing more frequently, especially during meals or when eating. Um, I would recommend that uh, for someone like this, uh, you know, uh, your elderly mom, I would recommend that, uh, you know, maybe she might want to see a uh, speech therapist. A speech therapist can actually advise, uh, you know, what kind of foods are suitable for her. Uh, they will advise you on how to mince the food, how to create the food, uh, choose certain foods which are always safer for her uh, to swallow. 
So sometimes liquids can be thickened by adding some powder so that she will swallow her food and drink more carefully and more safely without it going to the lungs. Thanks so much, Ken. Uh, uh, Celia. Can mm -hmm. we see the next question, please? Okay. Um, yes, uh, there are also a couple of questions on uh, upper airway uh, uh, these, uh, symptoms causing a cough. Uh, perhaps this one can be directed to Celia again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Yes, so uh, if upper airway cough syndrome, uh, for those in the audience who don't know, uh, this is actually also known as post-nasal drip. And this refers to the sensation of having mucus in the nose dripping backwards all right, into the back of the throat. And it often causes the sensation of wanting to clear your throat because all this dripping phlegm or mucus will pull at the back of the throat. All right. Now, it is very important that uh, if you have upper airway cough syndrome, the treatment is not cough syrup, but rather to reduce the production of mucus in the nose. All right. And very often in Singapore, most patients with rhinitis or you know, sinus often have allergies to dust mite and, and other uh, irritants. Uh, I would recommend that uh, you seek evaluation with a doctor. Uh, sometimes we actually will recommend uh, nasal steroid spray to reduce the production of mucus in the nose or even oral tablets uh, of antihistamines. These often help very well for those with upper airway cough syndrome or post in the trip. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Um, Sam, can I have the next question? Okay, yes, there were also a couple of questions, I think at least three to five questions on uh, post-COVID uh, cough. Uh, this one says, had COVID three weeks ago, um, a dry cough, x-ray was no signs of infection. And uh, you know, doctor has uh, given him 15 days of the step down prednisolone. How long did this cough last? And is it common to get such cough after COVID? Anyone? Yeah, thank yeah, thanks, Prof. Maybe I can answer the question. So uh, it is right, it is common for patients with COVID to have cough. In fact, it has been reported that up to 60 and 70% of COVID sufferers actually have cough. Uh, and up to 20% may have persistent cough that lasts beyond the three weeks that I mentioned. Now, uh, I can understand why this individual has very prolonged cough. That's because you have asthma. All right, if you have a chronic lung condition, uh, COVID infection can uh, be more serious. And very often, it may worsen your asthma control. Uh, that's probably why your doctor prescribed your penicillin to help with the uh, asthma symptoms. Um, I would recommend that uh, you know if, if your asthma control is poor, it is important to actually see your doctor again for review. All right. As mentioned, if you have a chronic lung disease and your pattern of cough changes, especially after infection like COVID, it is important that the doctor reviews your asthma control and adjust medicine as required. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah. It is common to get uh, this... Uh, post-COVID cough, and uh, you should seek opinions uh, if this continues to persist. Uh, can we go to the next question, please? How do we tell whether the cough is due to a virus or bacteria? Another back to you. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So as mentioned, actually the vast majority of acute cough, that means cough lasting for about a week or less, all right, is often due to virus infection. 70 to 80% of cases are actually due to viruses. Uh, in hospital, uh, where we have access to a very established laboratory, we can actually do a nose swap, a PCR swap, just like for COVID, uh, but we can test other viruses. And that's how we can actually confirm with uh, testing. But in reality, because viral infection is so common, uh, you can bet your money most of the time that actually it is due to a virus infection. So if you have a sore throat, runny nose, uh, muscle ache, a bit of fever, you can probably say that, yes, this is a viral infection, right? If you have warning symptoms, as mentioned, red flags like chest pain, you have uh, shortness of breath, all right? These are symptoms of lung infection or pneumonia. And that is when you see a doctor and the doctor will often do an x-ray, right? If your x-ray shows that there is a lung infection, then it's often due to bacteria. And that is probably when the doctor will then prescribe antibiotics. So if your um, cough lasts very long, or if your cough actually has red flag symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, then the concern is a bacterial infection and you should see a doctor for antibiotics. Thank you. Thank you. So can we go to the next question, please? All right, perhaps this will be one given to uh, directed to Dr. Lai. Uh, will early stage of lung cancer be seen in chest x-ray? And I think there was a couple of questions, uh, Gillian, on, uh, on screening for, for uh, lung cancer and whether chest x-rays are useful to 
thanks uh, for the question. So um, to answer this question first, will early stage of lung cancer be seen in chest x-rays? I think that uh, when presenting to a doctor with uh, symptoms of cough or any other concern, uh, when a chest x-ray is done, uh, what can be seen would be either a shadow or a lump, abnormal growth. Um, depending on, on you know, the other symptoms at that time, your doctor may ask you to see a specialist where a more um, you know, it's most uh, sensitive um, imaging may be done, for example, a CT scan. At that point, um, depending on what is found, the results of the CT scan, you may then be advised to go for a biopsy where, you know, um, uh, a, a sample of the abnormal tissue may be taken to check whether or not it is indeed uh, cancer or not cancer related. So yes, chest x-rays are still important in uh, diagnosing uh, lung cancer, including in the early stage setting. Um, the, the, the other question was relating to, uh, okay. Yeah. So um, lung cancer um, is, has, has been clearly associated with smoking and smoking definitely increases the risk of lung cancer. So lifestyle factors are definitely important. Other lifestyle factors that um, have been associated with uh, lung cancer include um, secondhand smoke, as well as a biomass fuel for cooking. Um, the other types of uh, um, Air pollutants that have been uh, associated with lung cancer uh, include asbestos, which is uh, um, which may be seen in certain occupations, uh, for example. Um, however, there is also an association uh, with family history. So, uh, people with um, family members, close family members who have lung cancer, may be at, at, at an increased risk of lung cancer, although a specific causal genetic link has not been described. Um, in terms of a lung cancer screening program, there is no um, current formal screening program in place, but the guidelines uh, have made recommendations for patients or, or for healthy individuals with a certain smoking history to um, discuss with your general practitioner uh, about whether or not you would be keen for a referral to a respiratory medicine specialty for lung cancer screening. Um, for non-smokers, I think there were several questions about non-smokers uh, and lung cancer screening. Currently, um, this is an area of ongoing research and there have been no recommendations made for lung cancer screening in the never smoking um, population. hope this uh, makes it a little clearer. Yeah, I think just to follow up, the thing I noticed two other questions. One is whether it's possible to prevent lung cancer and the other was whether vitamin B1 uh, played any role in uh, lung cancer pathogenesis or prevention? Um, okay, to answer the, the question on uh, vitamin B1, is that right? So uh, yeah. vitamin B1, I, I, I don't think that there is a clear causal relation between uh, vitamin B1 in preventing or causing lung cancer. Um, I mean, uh, people are always interested to see whether vitamins and supplements can help to prevent lung cancer, but I don't think a clear causal link has been described. Um, Dr. Lin, could you remind me what was the earlier question again? Pardon. Uh, the question is whether it's possible to pre prevent uh, lung cancer. Ah, I see. Okay, so um, um, smoking cessation is very, very important. It still remains as the most important modifiable risk factor. So um, the earlier you stop smoking, um, the better it is in terms of lung cancer risk reduction. And as well, and, and uh, furthermore, smoking cessation has also other non-cancer related health benefits. Um, but in terms of... Um, um, the, the reducing the risk of uh, lung cancer for non-smoking related lung cancers. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, there are no um, specific uh, measures that can be taken to reduce uh, your risk of a never smoking uh, related lung cancer. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a question here. Uh, again, perhaps either uh, Ken or, or Jillian, maybe we'll take this. I'm happy to take the question. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, when a cancer patient feels breathlessness or pain in the chest, it is true that uh, this may be a symptom of cancer or something else such as a lung infection. I think it is very important to seek medical attention if you feel unwell. Um, for uh, lung cancer patients, or you, um, such uh, individuals will be at increased risk of infection. So if there are uh, concomitant symptoms such as fever uh, you know, or chills, then um, it is important to seek medical attention because uh, conditions like lung infections can still be treated effectively with antibiotics in this setting. So do see your uh, oncologist or doctor if you um, have uh, symptoms of breathlessness and pain or other associated symptoms, even with a background of lung cancer. Okay, good. Thank you. Next question. 
Oh, another question on lung cancer. Okay. So I think uh, there, there are two other questions on lung cancer, and there was another question which I noticed in the chat on whether there's any markers or blood markers or biomarkers for, for detecting uh, lung cancer. So perhaps this can come together. Thanks for the question. So this is a very exciting area. Um, you, you are right that early detection of lung cancer is indeed very challenging. Um, um, in terms of uh, new technologies, I think there has been a lot of ongoing research about using blood-based um, biomarkers to supplement um, the lo um, uh, low-dose CT scans in detecting lung cancer. Currently, the gold standard for lung cancer screening in the smoking context will be still to um, use low-dose CT scans. Um, and um, the ongoing research is to see whether or not um, adding on um, a blood test to look for specific biomarkers may in, uh, improve the sensitivities of the existing um, technology of the low-dose CT scan. Thank you, Julian. Um, we have one question uh, next. Uh, okay. I think this is also talking about chronic cough. So maybe I can uh, ask this question to Ken. Um, if somebody has chronic cough, um, you know, are there, how do we worry, you know, how do we reassure this patient uh, whether they have risk of cancer or no cancer? How do we investigate this? How do we rule it out? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, uh, generally for patients with chronic cough, there's a, there's quite a few investigations that the, uh, the doctor would do for this patient. So as mentioned, uh, the, the things we like to rule out normally would be things like asthma. Uh, the, we'll ask more questions like whether there's uh, nasal drip, reflux symptoms and so on. If there's a, you know, concerns about uh, risk of lung cancer, um, then, I mean, Routinely, we would also do a chest X-ray, and if there's some suggestion, even uh, order for more detailed scans, a uh, CT, to see whether uh, that that you know uh, something might be picked up from there. Uh, because it is true that a lot of times uh, early stage lung cancer may may, may not have uh, many symptoms, but if let's say there were red flag symptoms like loss of weight, uh, that's significant, then yeah, I think uh, some of these uh, investigations need to be done. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, can we go to the next question? Oh, wow. Okay, um, yeah, I can take this question. In fact, uh, yeah, I've, okay. uh, yeah, okay. So why, why do females cough more often? So this is also something that, uh, that perplexes uh, uh, researchers. So, um, I mean, there's postulation as related to the hormones, you know, uh, the estrogens and so on, that makes this, the airways more sensitive. That's why uh, they have this cough hypersensitivity. Don't really know why, but uh, there's also a postulation that, you know, it might be at... Um, uh, it might be because, uh, how do I say? Okay, it might be an evolutionary mechanism, okay? Uh, because females get pregnant and uh, during pregnancy, they are more prone to say reflux and also aspiration. So uh, that's why uh, it is important to make sure that the cough reflex is, is uh, intact so that uh, this actually reduces the risk of, of uh, aspiration. Imagine if they're not able to cough, uh, you know, and then they, they might actually risk having a high, a high risk of aspiration. And I think that that's a postulation why females tend to have this uh, cough hypersensitivity more than males. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. That's great. Great uh, to know that there's one myth uh, busted. Can we see the next question? Is there not? Okay, so this is the last question. We have one more question. As time is going on to about 11.30. Yes, I have a chronic cough for years and done chest x-rays two years ago. Results were normal. The cough has got better, but now more frequent and now with phlegm. Uh, how do I get an appointment with the Refractory Chronic Cough Clinic? Michelle. Hi, Prof. Yes. Um, so uh, for the individual who posted this question and for the public, um, if you guys have cough that is um, bothering you and doesn't seem to get better with any of the medications prescribed by your GP or your polyclinic doctor, you can actually ask for a referral to the ENT or lung specialist clinic in SGH. And then um, your respective ENT or lung specialist will do the necessary workup before referral to the RCCC clinic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, time is now uh, getting on to the last uh, 
few minutes of the uh, session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I apologize that we've not been able to answer uh, some of your questions live, uh, but if you go to the Q&A chat box, uh, we have been able to answer some of them uh, uh, online, and I hope that uh, you will be able to benefit from uh, those answers. Um, as you have uh, noticed uh, from the uh, earlier uh, slides, uh, we have uh, set several uh, contact areas for you should you require uh, future consults. Uh, but it would be good to go to your GP or your polyclinic uh, to get the referral to us as well. Uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to uh, talking to you in future again about uh, other problems or other areas of uh, lung disease. Um, so it leads me to thank all of you for attending this morning's session and for each of the panelists for giving up on the time and effort to uh, talk in, in this public forum. Thank you so much for your attendance this morning. Thank you. Thank you.